And I believe we're live right now. Dude, I can see something flashing at me, so we are live. Fantastic. So let me go ahead to my page. I'm going to share this so we can get some more viewers going here. And uh, our, my first international <laughs> live oh, here. And uh, so let's like, see it right here as well. Share this. We and are. We're here. Yeah, see, uh, go ahead and share this uh, far and wide. Let's see how many viewers we can get. Uh, we have me from, uh, uh, or I'm from Australia. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we have James here from Australia, and I'm I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington area. So, uh, first international live stream that I'm doing here with Bow Wow Bill and um, James is the um, head of what is it? Balance? No. I got to get back to your page here now. I can there. tell. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. I can Andrew. tell. <laughs> check. Hey, guys. <laughs> I can tell you. I've got an idea on this. Hey, guys, I'm James, uh, obviously based here in Australia. We've, uh, we're have we breeders of American bullies here in Australia, which is Diamond Cross Bullies Australia. Uh, we also own a dog training business here called The Bully Revolution, where we rehabilitate and we train people's dogs. Yep. Mostly, you know, mostly around the bull breed market, but obviously we're training all kinds of dogs. That's that's me in a nutshell, Bill. Awesome. Yep. And so, yeah. you know, we were just chatting a little bit, and uh, I want you to kind of go over, you know, what we're we're both the same age, we're both uh, forty years old, and yep. uh, we both uh, remember doing this. And I, I showed you this picture. I'm going to show it again here. Me as a young lad. My first dog, Golden Retriever, Timber, uh, during around this time of year, Christmas time. And I've always had a desire to work with dogs. Um, and, and you did as well. Why don't you speak on that for a second? Uh, you, you've, you've always sure. had a desire, right? For sure. Like, you know, growing, growing up, we always had chickens and, and cats and things like that, right? So I grew up veggies and all that. But uh, always, always wanted dogs, right? And I remember pestering dad saying, hey, dad, I want to get a dog. And he goes, forget about it, go play with your chickens, right? So I thought, how am I going to convince him to, to, to buy me a dog? Because I want this, right? And, and it would have been back in the days where Lassie was on TV and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, so I went out and I got a ball, I got a lead, and I got a bowl, you know? And I thought, that's all the dog needs. Dad, look what I've got. I've got everything here. How about we get a dog? And he goes, no, right? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't understand. How can you not let me get a dog? I mean, I've gone out of my way and got this lead and this ball and everything, right? That, that was it. And um, so he goes, no, no, no. Anyway, I kept pestering because I wanted it and suggested, hey, how about we get a pig dog? And my brother, you know, at the time said, do you know what a pig dog is? And I said, yeah, I've seen one up the road. It looks like a dog. And uh, Dad yeah, said, <laughs> right? And uh, he said, look, if we're going to get you anything, it's going to be a collie, right? And I said, a collie? I said, oh, <laughs> like Lassie, obviously, right? So we ended up, uh, yeah, we looked, in the, we looked in the local paper because that's where you found dogs back in the day. And we saw one, $50 it was. So we went down there and there was a place called Canna Hooker out here and turned up and, and the, the mother was this beautiful Lassie looking, you know, collie. And I asked him, I said, oh, who's the dad? And I said, oh, the dad's from next door. It's a border collie, right? So as we went down there, all these puppies were just running around, but this one puppy just came up and just ran over and just jumped all over me, right? A little black, uh, black, white, and a little tan colored, you know? And I went, oh, my God, this is, this is dad. This is the pup. And it's fate. It's fate, right? Because he just, the dog wants it, loves me, right? Yeah. So I took this little puppy home, and, and I remember for two days, I, I didn't have a name. I didn't have a name for this dog. And, you know, I, I took it up the back of the chickens and it's stalking chickens and all this kind of stuff. And, and then this little, this rat runs across the backyard and this little puppy takes off and just grabs this, this rat. And sorry to be graphic anyway, but it, it deletes the rat, okay? So that's the yeah. end of the life of the rat. And I went, I know the name, it's Killer. The, that's Killer, right? The dog's <laughs> name Killer. Your dog Killer. Right. So... You know, I was, I was 13, years, 13 years old and people would go, oh, God, it's a beautiful dog, right? And it was beautiful. And I said, what's his name? And I would go, it's Killer. And they go, oh, Killer. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell them the story, but this dog is just, 
I'll say to you before, he grew up to be one of these, the most dominant, right, and aggressive dogs. This, this dog had a few live bites well, I mean, early on in the piece, right? So, when you look back, and this is why I tell people don't pick that first dog that just comes right out to you in that pack because that, that was him. Dog. Very independent and very, yeah. very strong-willed, and uh, that doesn't really lend itself to make a really good family dog because they're not looking for guidance. They're looking to give guidance. That's exactly this dog, yeah. That was exactly this dog. So it was, but yeah, like, I mean, just to keep it to keep it short, like we we'll say, but always, you know, and this, this was something that I always wanted to do. And I, I was saying to you before, you know, I went out there and I wanted to research as much as I could back in the day to just learn, learn about dogs. I ended up taking a local dog training school and, and getting books, the killer books that I told you about, which is back there on the shelf, which is back, yeah, yeah grab it. Look at this. Oh, have I ever run into my kennel? Hang on. I think I've got one. <laughs> yeah, somebody tagged Tony and Chetta. He's still the pieces and stuff. Yeah, there we go. Look, you can probably see it on stream. Old Keeler, look, old school. Look at look how old this, this book is, right? Yep. And, and I remember going through this book and and find ah oh, and the guard dog method of training and all this kind of stuff. So I had I had this little collie dog, this this border collie collie dog. We used, to, we used to just train, train dogs out in the front, front lawn. Right? So I would have been 16 years old. And we had, I had my friends coming over and saying, look, just tease the dog, tease the dog. And, and I ended up spending, back in the day, I spent a big, big money on this like protection sleeve. And um, we used to do it right there on the front lawn. Like, you wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that here now, out in the front lawn. Right. The cars driving by. Back then, it didn't matter. But um, it was an interesting dog. It was an interesting dog. I'd love to have that dog again. He was one of the only dogs that you could just look at, right, and just give him a little snarl, and he'd snarl right back at you without, without even thinking about it. You'd barely move him. You could talk to him like this, and he'd be just staring at you and, and uh, looking into your eyes and you'd chat away to him and all that kind of stuff, but you'd barely move your lip towards him like you're lifting it up. This thing, this thing would be growling back at you. Anyway, it was fun. Well, what, a, what a heck of a first dog, huh? Yeah, dude. Yeah. And what it was did you a, do? It was a... Uh, different now than you would then? Uh, of course you would, but... Yeah, he was... He wasn't a, he wasn't a hard dog. Like, he was a dominant dog, right? And, I mean, with, with the training we did back there, the dog was reliable, really. He was reliable, right? So, yeah, well. I mean, he'd walk wherever you'd go. He'd, he'd be there with you. And, you know, I wanted him to rev up and you'd have this... this um, you know, collar on your dog, just like a flat buckle collar. We were studs, obviously, right, to make it look tough. But you'd have this buckle collar on this dog, and the dog would bark, and you'd say, you know, watch him, and the dog, bah! and he'd fire off, and all this kind of like he was a he was an interesting dog. It'd be nice to have him again, just to just to enjoy the dog that he was, you know. But that's just memories, isn't it? Really, it's just yeah. memories, you know. And yeah, I remember we, my dog Timber. I would have him pull my skateboard, and yeah, and these uh, these birds and. And, uh, yeah, I mean, but he hated kids. He yeah, hated okay. kids, man. Like, like I've never seen, a, uh, even today, the extent of, of viciousness that this golden retriever would go after kids. And it was very alarming. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of got into uh, behavior work and uh, looking at the uh, underlying reasons of why some of these dogs act out this way. And um, and in 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 the the course of learning you stumble upon the true teachers and that's where uh i found keeler was um online and i've I read the book but i never really um knew the nuances of the training and it has a pretty bad reputation people come down on yeah. it as a yank and pull or but it's um when you learn from the best and i, I recommend people checking out tony Anchetta, and i'm going to see if he's if he will join me on one of these uh, broadcasts and, and discuss this. Um, but the nuances of it, it's one of the most gentle and fair methods I've ever uh, been taught and, uh, and also uh, practice myself. And it's something that I definitely recommend. If anybody is a professional, um, you know, it takes a, um, it takes an eclectic knowledge base. You have to have not just yeah. one set of teaching. You have to take it all because every dog is an individual. 
and and every person's the individual and then we have the environment that's always changing and uh as as a dog professional you're, you're trying to uh take all those variables into consideration at the same time uh, make a difference that is going to um you know uh, improve the quality of, of life for the dog and the right and, right yeah, right. I mean, look, uh, we spoke about the only training that I ever had on, on that methodology was out of a book. And there were some videos, you know, that came out around that time when I was 16, 17 that, you know, there were some infomercials on TV and was based around that kind of methodology, you know. But it wasn't until you and I spoke and I came across Tony that uh, I ended up taking Tony's course as well. So, and that's, that's when he showed, you know, when he got to show you the little nuances that I didn't fully understand in the book. Now, my GL got some great results back then, but it was, there's definitely an improvements and things that it's like, oh, yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's only so, it's, it's minute, but it does make a difference, you know. And then that's the stuff that, you know, when, when I go out and do some consultations with, with just clients, right, and they've got dogs, I mean, I'll always, I'm not sure how you do it, Bill, but I, I'll have a look at the dog. If the dog's generally a safe dog to work, I'll handle the dog and I'll say, this is what I'm looking for. And let yeah. me show you, right? And then I see the dog do it and I go, oh, yeah, the dog's doing it. You know, and then I'll get the lead and the dog just won't do it, right? So I've got to say, well, this is, this is why. It's, you know, it's part of your handling. It's part of your posture. It's part of your speed. You know, you're, like you're, you're being overly cautious in the way you're walking. You know, you're not, you're not just holding your presence and just walking confidently like, like as if your dog is just going to do it. You know, forget about looking at your dog and saying, come on, come on, come on. Just, just you know, walk and the dog's going to follow you know, it could be those little nuances in there. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, the, and the taking the whole picture into consideration. And, you know, we as human beings, we, we do a lot. We're just sitting here, you and I, even though we're worlds away, we can do, we can just sit here and watch a picture of ourselves <laughs> and then just <laughs> move our mouth with all these things <laughs> out. And we can convey a vast variety, a, a vast abstract variety of, of ideas. Um, where it's not like that. You know, these dogs communicate using space and they communicate yeah. watching body language. And, and if we are sending an unsure message with our body, that dog is going to pick up on that. And because we talk with our voice a lot of times before we talk or notice the, the nuances of body language, you know, the dog is going to pick up on that a, a lot of times before a human will. And I get it, but it's also, I tell people these dogs teach you a lot more about yourself than we can teach them. They're going to respond according to their environment. And I love what Sean, o Sean O'Shea says about, uh, I'm not the expert. This animal is the expert. This animal is going to tell us if what we're doing is right. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got your headphones. <laughs> yeah. He said hello. Yeah. You got a, how many girls you got, man? Uh, we got uh, two boys and two girls. And two boys, two girls. The little one, the little one that's just coming now. She's uh, she's an all. In the ones that you see with with the daughter, that's her. She's the one that's that's just been handling dogs since she was like a baby. You know, it's like she's she's got the finesse. Are you going to go past again? Do you want to cover the camera for you? <laughs> <laughs> just go quick and close the door. Go 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 one two three go. You did it. <laughs> I can't, right. I can't, I can't stop her. Just quickly, Bill. She's just wild. This one, right? She, she did a, a flip on a bed and she hit, she hit a heel and cracked a, a heel bone. And the other day she was playing and, and got a finger stuck in the door. She's just wild. Anyway, she's the best. Well, but, no, uh, all I need to know, uh, you know, was all, all I need to know about you, man, is, is, uh, watching you. When I watched a video of you having tea time, I think with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, that down was, the beach? I think so. It's when you were you were going full out, man. It was it was pretty cool. It was like uh, at a nice <laughs> uh, nice place, and uh, it was so sweet, man. So you know, it's it's uh, she's the best. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, and that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about because you're also not just a dog trainer, but you produce amazing dogs as well. You're a dog breeder now, and you're a family man as well. And you know how. How is that? A lot of people have misconceptions of, of what a breeder does and how much work goes into that. Yeah, uh, look, we've, uh, we've been breeding dogs now for, I don't know, you know, like ongoing breeding for, what is it, over 14 years now, right? So we kicked off with the American Staffies. 
Uh, and then we've gone into the American bullies. But breeding is they're here. The dogs are here, right? So you, you don't end up just generally with one dog because uh, as a breeder, you don't just breed a male and a female and then you just sell the puppies and you breed the male and the female again, sell the puppies. That's not, the, that's not what I would consider a breeder, right? So what I consider a breeder is, is looking at particular dogs, even like your, your, little, your little ones there, right? The mm-hmm. little cattle dogs, you look at the parentage and you go, right, which ones are the ones that I need to add into this particular female that's going to produce a better result for whatever whatever the reason, right? The reason could be, you know, uh, better structure, better type, better intelligence, whatever it is, right? But you match them up and then you've got this offspring. You've got this next generation that you look at and you go, well, I need to hold one of these back to see how, how it matures, right? So all of a sudden you've got one, two plus another pup, right? If you, if you don't have the male in your yard, that's fine, but you still end up with two dogs. And you don't stop there. You go again, right? Because then you, want, you need to improve the next generation. So you can end up with a few dogs, right? But then you've got to consider, then you've got to consider what is it in the best, uh, what's going to be the best thing for the animals? You know, is it having multiple dogs in your home and how much attention are they going to get? Because you're not, you're not going to have the attention to, to spread over 50 dogs, for instance. And I'm not saying we've got 50 dogs by any means, right? We've got nine dogs here, but you know, even nine dogs is a lot of animals to have, right? And you do have to, they, they want to be with you. They're the kind of, they want to be right beside you, right? Apart from that first collie, but they want to be right beside you, right? So you, you got to, you got to cater for this kind of stuff, right? So then as a breeder, you think, well, how else can I do? And there's different things that we did. We did uh, foster homes, co-own homes where they get to go in to live uh, into family environments, right? So the family environments, we've got one of these offspring to go, well, I want to see how this one turns out, um, but I don't want to keep loading up in my yard. So we find homes that these dogs can live with and live with ideally forever, right? It becomes their, their pet. And if a dog is suitable for breeding into our breeding program, they would bring it back for breeding and obviously it goes back to their home. But oh, it's just, it gets busy, right? It gets busy because, I mean, we've got four kids here plus right. nine dogs, so then... Uh, I've got obviously got my beautiful wife. So you, you've got to divide yourself in a way that's that everybody's happy. And it doesn't always work out that way, but you've got to try your best that way, you know? Yeah. I mean, happy wife, happy everybody too. Well, that's, where, that's where it starts, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. and that's what, what people need to realize is that, you know, this is your sanctuary and, it, it, you know, good things need to come from that. And some people – uh, I think get it backwards and look at this as just a money maker. And uh, then we start getting into unethical breeding. And um, what, what are some unethical ways of breeding and why do you consider them that? I'll, take, I'll start on what I said. You know, when you've got, um, we've well, just got two dogs, right? And there, there really is no purpose on, you've just bought yourself a male, you bought yourself a female and you go, Hey, what the heck I'm going to breed. Right. And, from seeing what's happened, right, even people that have purchased dogs from us, they might do a litter and go, this is all too much. You know, I can't believe the female didn't have the, didn't have the, the puppies naturally. They had to go for an emergency C-section. They lose half a litter, all these kind of complications that come in, right? So you see some well-meaning people just go, well, it's too much. I won't do it, right? So that's fine. Um, I think when we're talking about uneth- unethical breeding, it's when it comes into large, I think, large-scale commercial breeding where you've got a lot of different breeds, right? So right. if I'm saying nine dogs is a lot for one person, I mean, when you get into like a commercial, right, a commercial operation of having, you know, lots of different breeds and you're not going to give, you're not going to give those dogs the kind of life that they deserve, right? That's one thing, you know, the other, the other thing I know we've spoken about um, backyard breeding and, and I think when we talk about backyard breeding, we're more concerned with unethical breeding. Right? right, because generally you've got the normal suburban backyard here in Australia of you know they might have two, three, or even four dogs where they are there for the betterment of the breed, whatever it is, whether it's an American staff, a cattle dog, a chihuahua, they're there for the betterment of the breed, right? That's a backyard bred dog, but not a backyard breeder, you know, so. Unethical breeding when you're not looking after the welfare of the animal. Unethical breeding when you're selling. You know, to pet shops, unethical breeding when you're when you're doing the wrong thing by your animals and not giving them the time that they deserve as companions, 
right? I consider that unethical to me, right? right? So it the reason un- I have, yeah, the reason I have dogs is because I love dogs and I want to, I want to sit with them, I want to look with them, I want to talk to them, I want to take them for a walk, I want to see them run, you know, I want to see them go to the beach. That you to love- me is what, yeah, I love the animal, I love the dogs. Yeah. Well, and I mean, if you look at the work that's done by Bruce Lipton, and he talks about uh, epigenetics and the effect of environment upon our genetic makeup. It's not just bred into us. It's not or it's not just uh, determined necessarily. And um, when these dogs are raised, uh, you know, in a puppy mill situation, they're confined usually to squalid, overcrowded situations, minimal minimal shelter. I mean, minimal exposure to stimulus. Um, and then same thing too with those backyard breeders. A lot of times they, they don't get the, the, um, the, the stimulus that they need, the training, the imprinting that they need. Um, and it's, it's all motivated by money to make a quick dollar. And uh, I, I, I implore people to stay away from those types of situations but unfortunately, a lot of times these dogs end up in shelters and pounds. And we have that saying that, you know, people talk about shop or don't shop, adopt. And uh, it seems to be a quagmire that, that uh, it, it, mm. it, uh, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be a, an answer. I've been searching for an answer to this, you yeah. know, and it's what do you what do you think? I mean, there's don't always sh- back there. Don't shop adopt. Yeah, look, don't shop adopt. Yeah, look if look if there's an opportunity for you to uh, rehome or or buy a dog that's suitable for your family, then that's fantastic, right? Uh, depending on depending on rescues and things like that, sometimes they're putting out animals that I've seen that aren't entirely suitable for the particular family, right? So then obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, good rescues and rescues that want to save all the dogs, right? And that's where it gets a bit tricky, right? Because I've seen some dogs come through and they, they end up here for training, but the dogs aren't really stable, right? So they're, they're, they're putting a, an unstable dog in the hands of people that are wanting to save the dog, right? So it's, and you would have heard it as well, Bill. Um, hey, you know, they'll say, hey, Bill, I've just got, I've just got this, this dog and, you know, it's, it's three years old. Um, oh, it's had a horrible, it's had a horrible upbringing. It's been it this. Right, yeah, and you don't always know, right? But the dog's been abused, let's say, abused and all that kind of stuff, and, and that's why the dog's aggressive towards everybody. And you know, I don't, I don't want to be mean to it anymore. I don't want it to suffer anymore. So I don't want to say no to the dog anymore. And then you go, on, okay, all right. So you don't, you want to be nice to the dog, but you want the dog to be well behaved. And generally, a lot of these dogs, you know, they they haven't been taught lead because they don't want to put any pressure on the dog. They don't want to teach crate training because it's like, oh my god, you're going to confine the dog. And the dog was in a cage when we got it. It's like, right? So there's a lot of education that needs to come from it, right? So and you, because they've they've got big hearts and they want to save the animal, you need to make sure that your language that you're conveying to people is, hey, to give this dog the best possible outcome, right? Is we need to show it love this way. By creating an environment like a, a den for a crate is we're creating a safety net for this dog for the dog to feel safe and happy, just like this, right? So yeah. you, we need to tailor it. But, yeah, I mean, I, I know from the dogs that we, we breed here, right, so the American bullies that we breed here, we're looking at dogs for stability, right? So, yeah. And by the way that we've bred our dogs and the, the closeness of, of genetics that we've bred we know the reliability and the ease that the dogs have, right? So where uh, let, let's talk about your, your, little, your little dogs, right? High drive, uh, they're very inquisitive. They're really they're fun dogs to have, right? So if I create that in my American bullies, in all my American bullies that are generally bigger, powerful, and they're inquisitive, cool, right? And if they've got too much drive, that can become a handful for people, right? Because all of a sudden the dog sees something down there and the dogs, you know, the owners are like pulling back on the lead and the dog goes, oh my God, I need to go further forward in there and they become more agitated, right? So things like that for some of the breed that I have can be too much for people, right? So we've almost created the, the bloodline that we had was just an easygoing dog, you know? So people say, you know, um, what's it like? And it's like the dog's going to run down for 20 minutes and then want to sit at your side. 
and is happy, right? If you want to go for a walk up to the shops, the dog's going to walk, right? But if you want to go for a run for 10Ks, forget it. The dog's not going to, the dog's going to say, forget it. I'll wait for you here. Love you. You're a good runner. Good job. And let's come back. So, and that's, so when we're talking about don't shop, adopt, right? Uh, in regards to purchasing from breeders, I think it's a bit different from buying from reputable breeders that understand the genetics of the dogs they have and adopting. Yes, adopt, right? Because you can find the right kind of dogs and give them a beautiful home. Yes, yes. purchase from the right kind of breeder so you can see the mum, the dad, or understand, you know, you might be able to see the auntie or the half brothers and all that kind of stuff there and then. So you've got to consider that kind of stuff. If we're talking about buying from a pet shop, Dude, I don't know. It's, that's not. That's not for me. I want to do it. I want to no, do I mean, it. That's not for me. Stopping meals. That's that's. I want to look at that. And not only that, but we belong to an age of information. We belong to the social media age. Yeah. And I belong to these Facebook groups where I can trace back some of the brothers and sisters of my yeah. dog. You know, and that's yeah. so cool. You know that we yeah. can. We can we could message each other. Hey, does your dog do this? Or, you know, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And and when I heard, first heard that you you know put you did American bullies, I was just like, yeah. oh yeah, makes total sense, man. I it's a totally different dog when I have a Staffy versus a, an American bulldog, you know. And and uh, I love. I mean, they're a happy go lucky. Uh, they're not as drivey like you like you were saying. They're not as reactive uh, uh, to uh, you know different uh, prey drive or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, it just makes sense. And you have some beautiful dogs, man. Those, those dogs that yeah. I see are, are, uh, are, are pretty. I've been putting them up on the screen here. I'll see if I can well, find a few more. Um, now, for, for the, people, the people that are listening, I just want to make sure I just clarify something in, in what we're doing. Obviously, you've got the American staffies here in Australia and obviously in the States. Uh, just to make sure there's a distinction here into what the American bully is compared to an American bulldog, right? So you've got the American bulldogs. They, they come in, you know, the Johnson or the Scott type with the bulldog faces and all that kind of stuff. The American bullies in themselves come in different ranges in heights, right? So the stuff that we've got is called the pocket and the standard. But they've mixed. They're a mixed breed dog, which has obviously been around for over, over a decade, but they've mixed them. They've mixed them with bulldogs, like English bulldogs. They've mixed it with French bulldogs for some of the micro stuff. And when we get into the bigger stuff, they've mixed things like American bulldogs into, let's say, an American staffy and created this. these dogs that are like American bullies, right? So there's still a lot of diversity within the bloodlines. So it's, you know, if people are interested in getting to the American bullies, definitely do the research on what you're getting because they're going to have different... Uh, requirements right so the, the bigger the dog gets they've added mastiffs and all that kind of stuff so a mastiff is going to have a different um, predisposition for for guarding instincts for instance as compared to like a little english bulldog so just just keep that in mind that's just for the people watching and you know you would have come across that as well bill but yeah i just yeah. want to make sure there's a distinction there for people well here let me see if i can share uh my screen here again can you see my screen if i share this I can I can see you at the moment, so let's have a look. So let's see here. I'm going to add this here. So, what which dog is this guy? Can you see that? It's just Bow Wow Bill at the moment. <laughs> oh, it is. You don't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I just I put a picture okay. of a dog up there. It's a shorter dog with the white right up in the middle here and down, and uh, looks like it's got cropped ears down below, but. Uh, Maybe I'll take it down. I wonder why you can't see it, but yeah, I'm not sure. I can I can log into what page you're on there, and I can have a quick look if you want. It should be on the Bow Wow Bill fan page, uh, where this thing, or it should okay. you should be able to see it on your profile too, anywhere that this oh, is. Yeah, okay, yeah, I can see there on the. Um, I can't see it on my on my phone here, but I can see it on my computer screen. Yeah. Bistro, yeah, that's Bistro. Bistro. Okay, I'll yeah, put Bistro back on here. Let me throw him back yeah, up here. Yeah, Bistro. So he's. Uh, I've got a few people watching here now. So that's. Uh, Grand Champion Bistro, right, owned by Rob Lee from the Bully Market. Now, that dog there is the foundation on all our American bullies here in Australia, right? So, um, thanks, honey. <laughs> <laughs> She's, she goes, it's Bistro, it's Bistro. Um, oh, okay. Well, that's so good. <laughs> he, he was a foundation to all our American bullies here in Australia. He's short, he's compact, but his nature is just what, I'm say, what I was saying to you before. Yes, he's social. 
yes, is relaxed, and yes, is an ideal family companion. So the dogs that have been produced for us here on Bistro are just oh, just been just been awesome. They're just great, yeah. like I said, great for the family. Really we easy going. Dogs, you know, yeah, stability. dude. That's what we yes. refer to. When you hear a trainer say that I want a stable dog, that's yeah. it. It's kind of like all these pieces of the puzzle put together where we can we can really trust this dog easily. And and yeah. as trainers, we love those dogs. <laughs> I oh, do. But you know what? It makes – if you own one of these dogs, it makes you look like you're an experienced trainer, right? <laughs> because they're so easy and they're so attentive. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our dogs called Alaska, right? She's a bistro daughter. I'll go to the vets, and obviously there's a bit of training that, that's, that's come in there, but she's the kind of dog that will just stare at you in the eyes no matter what, right? So right. I go to the vets, and she'll, she'll look around, and she'll see a dog, and then she'll go, oh, there's a dog, and she'll just look back at you, right? She's not interested in pulling on lead to go towards the other dog and, and sniffing its buttons, and that's like, I know there's stuff going on here, and I know there's people walking around, but I just want you, right? So, you know, and then I, you take another one of these dogs, and they're the same. And they're just exactly the same, which makes owning these dogs so much easy. Stability, right? They don't get startled by things. It's almost, it's almost like as if they're a little bit lazy to the environment, right? It's like, yeah, I can see that, but I don't care. Like, I want to do, I want to do what you're doing. Let's give me some food, you know? Like, let's hang out. Yeah, yeah, I love them, Bill. Yeah, I mean, there's some beautiful dogs, and I think that it goes to mention that it's important to meet the parents. And, you know, just like if you know somebody that is, uh, uh, you know, and you know their parents, there, there's some similarities that you're going to find <laughs> with them, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny when you see somebody who's older and you know who's, whose dad they are, <laughs> by their mannerisms, and it's tripping you out. You're like, man, you're just like dude, your father. Yeah. yeah. Dude. Or you see your dad, your own self, your own dad, yeah. with, you know especially with your kids, but, and that's the importance yeah. of, of knowing that lineage and, and looking at that and respecting that and, um, and not just putting a dollar on this, but, but documenting it. And, um, and like you said, looking at traits that you can add that are going to improve the stability of this yeah. animal. Yeah, exactly. Like even, even when we're talking about that, even with my own kids, right? So Nature and nurture. If we talk about nature and nurture, and this comes into the animals as well, there's a, there's a certain amount of genetic, uh, you know, disposition there that just they just are. They just they just are like this, right? So I'll use my own kids as, as an example. Eldest boy, he's like me, smarter than I am, right? Because he takes it after his mother. But a lot of a lot of the character traits are just like me. I'm like my father, you know. Like I never wanted to be like my father with certain traits, but then I see it and it's like. I oh, do. There's a lot of things that I'm doing the same as my dad, right? So, you know, even my oldest daughter here, who's you know, she's the third in the family, but she's she's like me, right? Like she's she should be outspoken, should be should be dominant, should be inquisitive. You know, she's just all action. Where the second boy, Sol, he's much more, he's much more artistic, right? He's much more like their mother, right? And the right. youngest daughter is like Sol. Right, so out of our four kids, two are like me, two are like their mother, and they just are, and they just are. Like, there's the, they're born, they grow, and one of them likes, you know, my, my daughter wants to get dressed up in these beautiful dresses, right? And my other daughter goes, forget about the dress. Yes, I'm a girl. I love the girl stuff, but let's go play with some dogs, right? right. So there's a certain, yeah, and this is the same for the animals. There's, there's a certain amount of genetic disposition there. So when you breed two animals together, Right, especially if they're related and they've got the same kind of traits, you you know it's going to come out more in those puppies, right? So then you can look at your own breeding program and go, well, do I like that? Yes. Do I want to produce more of it? Yes. So who's going to add the? Okay, that dog there is perfect for that. Let's go. Did it turn out? Yeah, pretty good. You know, obviously when you breed closer together in the breedings, that's when negative stuff can come up as well. So you need to be aware of that and document and all that kind of stuff. So if you see, for instance, I don't know. Um, deafness. Short, yeah, oh yeah, deafness, short tails. If there's, if there's been too much bulldog added into the bloodline, you can get shorter muzzles with a bit of a bulldog bite, shorter tail, all that kind of stuff. So you need to have a look at that kind of stuff. So if you're breeding cousins, for instance, you know, and you put them together, you're going to go, well, you're going to get more of the similarities of that. 
good points, bad points. You need to be aware of it as a breeder. So, yeah. When he also did Dutchies, I got to put up some of your Dutchie litters here as well. And those are working dogs. Beautiful dogs. Very intelligent, very energetic. Uh, big requirements for the Dutchies. Not as much as the Malinois. Uh, but if you've got one up there on the screen, there was a dog called Nala. One of the, there's a guy in the in over in New Zealand now. I don't know if you've uh, had the opportunity to to speak to him. A guy called Sam. Yeah, yeah, Alan's Sam. Canine. Yeah, I'll, I'll get him on here. He's a he's a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. Well, he he's got one of the puppies from that breeding. Oh, fantastic. He, right. So that dog there. What, what a life that dog's got. Which one? You know? Oh, Sam's dog. Yeah. Yeah. What a yeah. dream life. You know. Yeah. Dude, I mean, that dog gets out there with, what is it, 20, 30 other dogs, and they take him to the rivers, and, and I saw there, if you're watching Sam, hey, Sam, um, I saw there, like, the Love Christmas party, they, they got huskies and shepherds and, and bullies and everything there. But that's unreal. That's unreal. There's a lot of st stability in that pack there. Yeah, you better believe it. Well, and I think that that speaks for itself. You know, it's the dogs, let the dogs speak for themselves because they speak their own language and we speak our own language. We're different species. And yeah. uh, when we can get them all together in a cohesive unit like that, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty remarkable. We got some comments here. I want to see if we have any questions at all here for you and uh, or, or if any of the viewers have any questions. And feel free if you have any questions that uh, – you uh, go ahead and, and uh, ask down. Oh, Bistro. Everybody's down in the comments going, it's Bistro. Hey, it's B Jim. It's Bistro. It's Bistro. It. Oh, got it. Yeah, a lot of people are lo loving your pups, man. And, and I agree <laughs> with them. It's just, I mean, so, so good to see uh, when you have somebody that is well-respected and, and, and does it for the right reasons. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard when you, as a professional, when you know the value of good breeding and you see people that make an emotional decision and they get a dog that is wrong with the family. I mean, it's literally going to be a main see. management, you know, issue for the next decade of their life. Yeah. And it just, you know, that's, that's a lot of times what, what, I try to get in before and match make and, and find a dog for people. And especially if you are going to get a dog that is known as a powerful breed or a high maintenance dog, I, I implore you to, to use the help of, of a professional. So you do pick out the right dog that is, is right for you and your lifestyle. When, 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 I mean, even for yourself, Bill, when, when you're recommending dogs for people, are you, do you personally help them find, you know, dogs like we'll say before out of shelters and things like that, or how do you go about helping them find have, the right kind of dog? I want to know, you know, what they want. I mean, it's their dog, and so you know, we have some books that I'll refer them to. Um, and, you know, the right dog for you. Here's one just sitting right here. Do right dog for you. This one's an old one by Doctor yep. Takora. And I mean, there's questions that you can ask that kind of go through these different breeds. But, you know, these, these are honest uh, for the most part, you know, uh, where a lot of times uh, you'll, you'll see, you know, descriptions of these dogs. And Jennifer and Hack and I were talking about this. Uh, she just posted up one. Let me see if I can find it so I can share it on here uh, about uh, the description that the AKC gives of the Malinois. And I want you to see this. Uh, uh, it is basically showing this, this working dog lounging on a couch. Oh, and oh. Yeah, and if you've ever if you've ever met a Malinois, you would know that that Malinois would would much likely be <laughs> enjoying the couch as a as an hors d'oeuvre instead of as a. As, <laughs> it's almost as like that. Uh, do you remember the movie? Well, let me you show it. Mooch? I'm going to put it up on the broadcast here so people can see what I'm talking about here. So here is the the AKC's description of the Belgian Malinois. Uh, the Belgian Malinois is perfect for millennials. What the hell does that mean? For young people? Okay. Uh, young and active? Who, yeah, who want a big athletic dog. A Malinois needs lots of exercise every day, so they make great companions for young people who live active lifestyles. Oh. Can, can you see the picture that they put on there, James? On I can see it now, yep. What a, and then so uh, Malinois are also highly intelligent and trainable, 
and they are extremely loyal to their owners. Uh, when you get a Malinois, you are essentially getting a right hand dog that will stick with you for life, and that has no off switch. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't. Generally, they don't have an off switch. They don't have an off switch, so they need to put that like it's on all twenty four seven. Like if you step, make one step, that dog is like, "All right, where are we go? What's going on? Go. He's a bull. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? They, they got it, and you'll be you you'll be there, and and they pick things up, and they just want to go, 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 go. It's like <sighs> I've had a good yeah. day. Like how about we just sit down? They go, okay, let's sit down. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's go again. You know. That's a big resource for people that, and they'll believe that. They'll be like, see, this dog's fine. And then they'll go get this dog who's going to turn out to be a nightmare. And unfortunately, a lot of these dogs end up having a date with a needle because, yeah, you know, yeah. they just can't find a, a good home for them. And I see it all too often and it's heartbreaking for me. Um, but, you know, do, do your research. And that's why we want stable dogs. And there are stable Malinois. I mean, sure. there are, but they're just high, high high maintenance dogs and from somebody who works with dogs for a living look at how many malinois i have <laughs> yeah 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 hey look i i had that duchy i had the duchy for a little while because i've always like you know in, in the early days i had working dogs and dobies and things like that i used to do a lot of bite work with them and all that kind of stuff and i loved it right but it didn't suit my lifestyle now you know and even even when i i, I did get a the duchy at this age, right, it's like, oh, as fun as it is and as much as I love playing fetch, it's just too much, right? It's just too much where, you know, my daughter walks in and I'll be playing fetch, like, oh, hang on, I've got to do this. It's like it even didn't match now, you know? So you've got to be aware of that kind of stuff, you know? You've got to be aware of it. So finding the right home, look, I found the right home uh, with the family up in, up in Sydney and, and they, they put her to good use up there and, you know, looking after their dogs and, and all that kind of stuff. But... Yeah, he, you need, you need an off switch. I want a dog with an off switch. You know, yeah. most of mine have got a permanent off switch where they're just chill, yeah. right? So, so maybe I need an on switch for those guys. But uh, it, look, it does, it does make owning nine dogs easier. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if it was nine Malinois in your backyard, you'd be going mental. Yeah, man. I mean, just go look at the videos of Malinois puppy litters and the guy just trying to walk out the door. Did you did you ever see that uh, video? And it was it was a guy that had that must have been about five six months old, and it was in a it was in a building, and I, I think he had I'm not sure if he just had cargo pants on or not, but these I these think. males just threw themselves at him, and all that little piranhas just hanging off him, and he couldn't get them off. Right? I wonder if I can find that. I gotta you, see if I can. You know I, what I'm talking about, right? It. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. see if I can find it and then add it to the screen so we can give a little bit of uh, of uh, truth to. Uh, what what we're saying here well and it's different when you when you observe something versus read about something right when you have direct yeah. experience with with a, a subject matter i think it's a totally different ball game than uh just reading about it and uh you know studying it and so you know that's why it's important to, to talk to a professional that has have had on, on hands experience with these types of dogs and um yeah let me see if i can find this Yeah, picking a good Malinois puppy here. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I got a guy here with just, I mean, there's so many on here. These these pups are seven weeks old. And um, I wonder if I can put it here. Yeah, let me, let me add them to the screen here. So here's some Belgian Malinois puppies. So the guy's just walking around, not even... Not even really engaging with them, just walking. And this isn't even that bad. But look at how they're just grabbing on his leg. Yeah, that's it. There's one. You know, and, and imagine these dogs are seven weeks old. They don't know what they're doing. There's one in the background. Oh, no, that doesn't look like it. That might be a... Right. So when, even, when you look at, even when you look at dogs like that, Bill, right? So are they going to be ideally suitable for families or are they going to be suitable for the services? Which is, I mean... Obviously, while these dogs are being produced for the most part now, whether it's, you know, your sporting, your sporting events such as your IPO, your Schutz and Mondio ring, or, right. you know, your, your services like the army or the police. 
Yeah, working working dogs. I mean, yeah, you know, working dogs for that kind of stuff. Families, you know, you know, you don't want a working dog with an unemployment situation because they're going to figure out a job on their own. Yeah, and um, and that's it. It's just it's it's doing a due diligence and knowing that this dog is going to live fifteen years. Yeah. And do you want a 15 year problem or do you want a 15 year uh, delight? You know, and that's kind of what we do as professionals is educate people um, to what can be. And also, you know, I also tell people about these books that have, you know, thousands of different or different breeds in here. I think 900, not a thousand, but and, and what these breeds were meant originally meant for. Oh, my goodness. Look at this dog, dude. I just opened it up. Ooh, what's that little thing? Looks uh, like an aardvark. Yeah, look at that here. Let's see if I can. Can you see it? In. <laughs> uh, say it again. Yeah. <laughs> pronounce, pronounce it again. In, in, it's like I Z C U I N. I don't know how to pronounce it at yeah, all. Yeah, that thing. That little thing. Can you read, nice short... can you read it? No, I can't read can that. Just... <laughs> I can't read that. <laughs> I can't read that, but I do have a question for you, though. Right, so people go out and buy these whatever breed they choose, right? So, with you know, whether it's a Malinois or an American Staffie or a little cattle dog, they they love these dogs. Most people are going to see an animal and they go, "I love the look of that animal," right? And generally, they're not going to do their research uh, before they go ahead and buy the dog, and then they go, "I've got my dog now. I'm going to go and do my research," right? Mm, so, right. obviously, the best suggestion is, "Hey, uh, talk to a professional." Uh, get some advice, go and see some dogs and see how they, they would relate to your family. That's ideal. But now somebody's got this dog and they go, right, um, I've got a puppy and, you know, I see a lot more responsible people these days going out and going to puppy school, right? And then they sort of let it go and the dogs are grown up, right? So if somebody goes out and gets themselves a puppy, I mean, what do you, what do you suggest? Do you suggest a little bit of puppy school? Do you suggest working with a trainer? Do you suggest letting the puppy grow up and just see what the raw state of the animal is? What What are some suggestions for people? I know well, what I think, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, yeah. and people ask me, how long do I train my dog for? You know, and I, I have to remind them that this is a lifelong endeavor. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. something that doesn't, we don't just stop. But um, it goes into, you know, what the what the people want with this animal and, and uh, what what kind of, dog we're working with and and uh but the first thing i want is them around other puppies when they're young just like when we were kids yep you know we, we would run around on the, the playground and play tag kickball or whatever we might get in a fight or or what you know we figure it out together we figure out how to yeah. how to work things out um but and as we get older there's a totally different set of standards placed upon us and uh, and there's a totally different motive that we have as individuals on what we, we seek uh, for for fulfillment and happiness. Um, you know, so I, I definitely want them working with the dog from day one. Day one, I want them working yeah. with the dog, uh, really formally working with the dog at six months and then seeing where that dog wants to go with it. If the dog yeah. really takes to it, then let's take it to, you know, <laughs> the end degree and get this dog titled and, and uh, you know, let's let's see where this dog can go. And, and but I'm kind of an advocate for that animal. You know, I'm always in this situation, uh, and I tell people I'm kind of like the attorney for the dog. <laughs> I represent the animal. And uh, so, what do you what do you think? Uh, that, did I answer your question? You did, man. Yeah, you did. Um, just sharing this this out, Bill. Here we go. Um, Look, I think puppy schools are fan. Well, puppy schools are good, right? Take them out to puppy school and get them around other puppies, right? Um, obviously, there's going to be good and bad puppy schools out there, right? There's even been people that have been kicked out of puppy school, right? So, and they've got these these little high drive little animals, right? So, you know, when you get that kind of situation, you need to go to an experienced trainer. Uh, not not always just a vet nurse, right? So, but there's, there are some good puppy schools out there. So get them out, socialise them around other dogs. Uh, one of the things that we do here with our dogs, obviously, with us having adult dogs and obviously having that stable nature. Now, being stable, being relaxed, you know, no way indicates that they're either they're subordinate dogs in any way because they're very confident dogs, right? So uh, we bring dogs in here for rehabilitation. 
we do a little bit of foundation training, but then our dogs are there to support us in what we're doing, right? So we've got dogs that are confident, right? Stay Model. relaxed, right? So even when we have puppies with their mother, when they get to about four weeks old and they come into the five weeks old and then they're getting out in the grass, we put them also with some of the other adults, right? So we'll put them out with one of the other females and those females are, are confident, strong, you know, they're not, they won't, they're not going to run over and knock over that puppy. They're not, they're going to walk near that puppy. The puppy's going to go up and bite it and try to nurse, but they still starts to give them another element of animals and they start to learn the communication between the dogs, right? Because one of the challenges that I see when, when we're doing rehabilitation with dogs as adults is some of these dogs haven't learned social skills, which is right. what you were saying before, right? So yep. the, these social skills are learned. So we start giving the dogs the social skills here with our dogs, but people need to continue that, right? So let's just say somebody goes out and buys a dog and these dogs have just had the, the mum and the dad there and that's it. And then they go to puppy school and that's it, right? And then they do nothing. The dog grows up. So where you said they start some formal stuff at around the six months of age, it's, it's, it's essential for them, for them to do that kind of stuff, right? To, to shape the behavior of the dogs from the beginning, Shape the behavior that you want in your dogs from when you get your puppy. Don't wait. If you wait till the, the time the puppy's all grown up, you've got a lot of these behaviors that have, that have been reinforced, right? So you've been reinforced, not you, Bill, right? But I'm saying uh, you, me, right? All of us, right? So whatever we pat, we reinforce. So if the puppy's jumping up on us, for instance, and we go, oh, it's so cute, and we pat him, we push it off, and the puppy comes running back and jumps up on you again, oh, we pat it, push it off. We're reinforcing that dog to, to, to be more dominant and aggressive towards the jumping up. And, and then you end up with this adult dog, right, that is jumping up on people and guests and, you know, even walking on lead. It's pulling on lead and you're pulling back on the lead and there's pull it, all that kind of stuff. So I always say definitely shape the behaviors of the dogs that you want as an adult. Never expect that the dog is going to grow out of it, right? It ain't going to grow out of it. It's going to reinforce whatever it's been doing and being successful at doing. So reinforce the stuff that you want, you know, guide it into the stuff away from the stuff that you don't want or correct it if you need to. And then so then you, you end up with this six month old dog or seven month old dog that's just you're looking at it going, this dog's awesome. You know, this is what I'm after because that dog be there at six, seven, eight, nine months old, especially when they get bratty at nine months old and their testosterone and all that kicks in, you want to make sure you've already given the dog the foundation, right? So then by the time it gets to 12 months old, 30 months old, it's already the kind of dog that you want. Not, yep. hey, it's going to grow out of it at two years old or four years old when it finally matures. Oh, dude, you know? Well, and then, and then that love and that gratitude that you, yeah. that you lavish on that dog is real because you really love this dog. It's an awesome <laughs> dog, you know? Yeah. And that's what I tell people is we got to get it there. And, they, I mean, it takes consistency, but it also takes, you know, tailoring it to your life and your specifications, you know, and that's where people ask yeah. me, how long, do I, my, how long does my dog need to sit over there or stay in that in the place? Or And I'm like, how long is your conference call? <laughs> how long, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, make dinner? How long, you know, there's no really set parameters. We are overlaying this to your life and your needs and expectations of this animal. And, um, and great points, man. I mean, you know, get them, get them young, even as kids. I mean, we get them young and, and, uh, um, you know, we, we teach them stuff uh, that they learn throughout their whole lives. That's why they call it the formative years or formative years, right? Yeah. And so we give them in large format that they can draw or, or write a lot of programs on. For, yeah, for later. yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Ima yeah, sure. Imagine trying to play, uh, you know, uh, Xbox game on an old Commodore 64 or something, right? It's not going to work. And so... Uh, it takes work, though. And we have a question here from uh, Reno, Rene Daryl Brisbane, so uh, Australia. What's the best thing to feed puppies? Ooh, for me, uh, look, predominantly the, the most of the things that we feed here are raw. So being a busy house, you know, <laughs> there's been times, Bill, you know, just between you and I, I've forgotten to get out the frozen food, right? So if I get caught out, then... We'll find what's there, whether it's been the sardines or even some, some premium dry. But predominantly, we're feeding a raw food, right? So even puppies, uh, feed raw. We'll keep it clean. Uh, eggs, chicken, beef, you know, 
uh, veggies. Just just mix it up. You know, you add your coconut oil in there. Uh, you put your hemp seed oil, whatever it is. But it doesn't have to be the same thing every day. You know, just mix it up. So if you think of it in a, in a block of seven days, for instance, and you're looking for, and this is this is my thoughts, right? So if you're looking at a, at a balanced diet, you're not going to feed. Well, I'm not going to feed the same thing every single day, right? It's not going to be exactly the same proportions. It's going to be this is what I've got here. We've cooked some stuff in the kitchen. We've got some eggs left over. This is going to go towards the dogs, right? That's part of their meal. And the next day we go, oh, we need to add a little bit of this. The next meal, oh, I forgot to leave any frozen stuff out, so we need to use this kind of stuff. But uh, mostly raw is definitely what we feed. I mean, post up what you've been feeding, Renee, if you you like, but uh, there's there's a few good resources around. And when we go back, we can can certainly add them here. There's some people here in Australia. I mean, you're up in Brisbane, uh, but some people that that make some pre-made raw food. Uh, Our friend Jacob up in Sydney, so he, he will... Make the food and you'll send it, but probably not up to Queensland. So <laughs> it won't won't be too fresh. But stick to raw, and I think you're going to do good. I do yeah. have to add. I do have to add something there because of the breed that we're in, uh, and we're, we're talking about Amstaffs and bullies and all that kind of stuff. All these bull breeds, which are you know, a beefy muscular. I know it's everybody's everybody, and I'm painting it with a broad brush. Want to make the dogs look bulky, right? So. If you're buying yourself a puppy, keep this puppy lean. Let it grow up slow, right? You don't need to pack on the beef thinking that it's going to be a beefy adult if you keep it beefy at four or five months old, right? So if you walk out of my yard, my five-month-old puppies are all lanky. Like, they're just, they're just pups, right? So let their bones develop. Let their joints develop. Let them play. Let them run. All that kind of stuff. If, if you find that the puppies, yeah, dude. Like, if you find that your puppies are starting to get fat, Ease off on the kind of food that you're, you're giving, whether it's, it's the content of you know, fat that you've got in the, in the diet of the dog uh, or the amount of food that you're feeding, like ease off on it, right? So definitely grow your puppies nice and lean so they're, they're healthy and then let the genetic potential come out as they mature, right? That's when they, their bodies are strong enough to be able to handle this additional size. Let the bones sticking out like they're supposed to. Make sure they eat the eggshells, which gives them the calcium and all that kind of stuff. So... Let them mature slowly because the genetic potential of what you have is going to come out anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, give them yeah. the best. Give them the best. And, and like you said, let nature do its course. Don't, don't try to force it. Hurry things along. Um, and we got a comment here. American bullies are w- more well-balanced than other breed. Great for family, especially with kids. And I would agree. Um, yeah. With Spot that. on, Jay. Yep. You can see that comment. So Yeah, I saw uh, that one. How, how, how do people find you? Um, well, all over, all over the net, right? But on, I mean, we're on Facebook now, so you can find me under Diamond Cross Bullies Australia uh, for all our breeding stuff. So Diamond Cross Bullies Australia. Uh, you can oh, also find us on, yeah, if they put in facebook.com forward slash Diamond Cross Bullies, that'll go to our particular page. Uh, if they find us on Bully Revolution, then that's all our training stuff. So we can, we can put some links up there and, and people can go to our page and, and find out a little bit more. You can ask me some questions, anything you like. So, yeah. Very good. Well, how about now yourself, it's... Bill? How, how are people going to find you? And, uh, how about Bill? Or, 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 or <laughs> Facebook.com forward slash Bow Wow Bills, Bow Wow Bill uh, at gmail.com. Uh, you can call me at 353 or 206-353-Bill. <laughs> A question for you, right? So, look, there's, there's sure. going to be people here from Australia that are watching watching this video. Okay. So, if people are interested in getting in touch with you, right? Uh, I mean, do you, can you do Skype consults, FaceTime consults uh, for people that m- might want to ask you questions about whether it's you know training or rehabilitation or any of that kind of stuff? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, it works better hands on, of course, and there's limited to what we can do. But, you know, we can we can get an overall uh, view of, of the problem and, and thin slice your situation. Um, and I can definitely make a suggestion for action items. And my my big thing is the why, you know, the why is very powerful. Why are we doing this with this animal? And, and if the person that you're working with that one doesn't have have good dogs, you know, that's a sign right there. You want to have anybody that you hire to do a task to be able to do the tasks that they're hired to do (laughs) and so meet their dogs. Um, And and then also uh, to know why they're doing it. And, 
And so that's that's my goal. And, and I love I love meeting people and work with people all over the world and uh, love what I do. I, I don't uh, I mean, I've done this as, and we've talked about this, too. You know, as you were yeah, told, man. what were you told when you were growing up and say, you know, I, I want to be a dog trainer. I don't <laughs> I want to, you know, and, and well, no, so. Well, for starters, he said, go and play with your chickens, right? But outside of that, when I started training the dogs, he said, you're never going to make money training dogs, meaning you're never going to have a life. You're never going to, have, you're never going to be able to raise a family if you just train dogs, which, which, is, which was never the case, never the case, right? So we're back down training dogs. I mean, we, we've got our breeding dogs here as well. But, you know, we're getting to do, well, I'm getting to do what I love. Uh, which is very similar for yourself, you know. I do love the animals, but I absolutely love working with people, right? So being able to help and, and teach and coach, I mean, I'm a natural, I'm a natural teacher, right? So I want to share and give out everything, right? So if people, if people want to say, oh, Jim, how do I do this? It's like, oh, let me share it with you. Let me show you, you know. Yeah. And, and people who are interested, I want to give and, and share, you know. You quickly learn if, if people are there for to learn or to take advantage of. That's a big difference, right? So if people are genuinely interested in learning and you know they're authentic, then you just give. Yeah, for sure. Well, the, the guardian of knowledge is a big problem in this world, and there's one of my favorite sayings ever is uh, "secrecy is the enemy of healing." And uh, I'm I, I love uh, you know transparency, and I, and I I love to to help people as well. So. Um, and these dogs, they, they, uh, they give us so much, you know, they give us so much fulfillment in our lives, uh, that this is the least I can do is help bring some fulfillment to their life as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's Bill, it's been fantastic, man. It's yeah, it's been, been fantastic. Awesome, dude. Thank you yeah. for your time. And, uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. I'll, I'll put some links down below in the comments here, of the video and, and thank you, everybody from Australia. Uh, I was showing uh, James earlier that we had snow on the ground where I'm at, so it's cold and and winter here. So enjoy your summer, enjoy the nice weather. Yeah. I think, Bill, we're gonna have to swap some Christmases. I think you might have to come here for for a summer Christmas, and I think we need to go there for a winter Christmas. Yeah, you never had a winter Christmas, huh? No, man, never. That's crazy to be. No, never, never. I want to put on I want to put on the Christmas outfits with the sweaters. Please You'll tell me you wore one. Did you, did you wear a sweater? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got, <laughs> yeah. You better believe it, man. Ugly sweater. Yeah, dude. Ugly sweater, eggnog. Uh, <sighs> yeah, we got it all, man. And it's and, and I like it because you're kind of forced in together in, in a cozy situation yeah. and, and uh, the fire. I couldn't even imagine being Christmas in summer. I just couldn't. I mean, it doesn't uh -huh. even compute. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm definitely down. I want to come down there and check it out. So, uh, and if we, if I do end up coming down there, we'll definitely do some dog uh, event, a seminar or something uh, together where we can um, uh, teach people who are interested in your area as well. Okay. Let's do. Let's let, let's plan it out. So let, let's talk. Let's talk about this and let's just make it happen. Yeah. Awesome, brother man. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, dude. And, Thanks, uh, thanks, man. All right. See you, everybody. All right, guys. Catch you later. Thanks, Bill. Hold on one second.